this is simply Travis without Rowdy 5000 Day because he is a bit under the weather. Uh, and this is the real Simply Travis. This is not a pod person. There has definitely been no chicanery, skullduggery, or malfeasance acted upon Simply Travis to make him buy an Xbox One, which is what I, the real Simply Travis, who is a long-time Nintendo fanboy, will be talking about on this special Xbox One side quest edition of the Lamer Gamers podcast. So today I'm going to be talking about the absolutely ridiculous amount of games I've been playing, uh, including one interesting beta called Morphe's Law, which isn't for Xbox, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Uh, plans for upcoming streams, upcoming games for the Xbox franchise. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the news on xCloud and end up with some fake news surrounding Microsoft's plans to take over the world. I mean, the gaming industry. So, let's get to it. <laughs> game I wanted to talk about was Morphe's Law. So Morphe's Law is kind of like a Dia de los Muertos stylized arena 3 versus 3 shooter. It actually did start out as a 4 on 4 shooter, uh, but they recently changed the mechanics after hearing some feedback. And what it does is it centers around the core mechanic of stealing mass from your enemy. So basically let's say you shoot their chest, well your chest gets bigger, or your arm gets bigger, and that can affect what type of damage you do, and essentially how you play the game. So if you shoot, I want to say the right arm, your shots do more damage. If you shoot their feet, you run faster, you shoot legs, you jump further. And one of the weirder ones, if you shoot their butt, your butt rocket allows you to fly further. You heard that correct. There are butt rockets in this game, um, which is kind of a weird thing. So the thing with this game is they're in beta right now. And they've been playing around with trying to make it better because the unfortunate story is this game launched on the Nintendo Switch a while back and it did not have a very good start. Uh, it was a really fun game. I was really excited about the concept. I went and you know, it was like a $20 game because they talked about how they wanted to release a game that was a full game without doing free-to-play or a lot of microtransactions to make you play it. Uh, but it, there was just so many bugs. There was a bad lag with it because, you know, they haven't really tested it properly in a large environment. Uh, it was really hard to get a match found, but let alone to keep one going. Uh, so right now they're actually trying to fix that, and they've been using these Steam betas to help fix issues for the 2.0 version that is going to drop on the Switch. And it's also going to drop on PC. So they're working on some cross-play. So how does the game play? Well, the main goal is you're stealing masks from the other team in all the modes. However, in the background, there is always these giant robots that have the team colors that are watching you. I mean, they're really not menacing, but you're basically making them grow. And the whole thing is, at the end of the match, whichever one grows the most basically punches the other one and he falls down. It's kind of like a weird version of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, which I know Rowdy always makes fun of me. I can hear it now. You think every game looks like Xenoblade Chronicles 1, and I, I kind of do. But it it looks like it. If you've ever played Xenoblade Chronicles 1, uh, you are essentially playing on these gigantic uh, mechs, so to speak, or gods, and they were frozen in place. And that's kind of what it looks like. So... Now, what happens is how do you get to steal mass? Well, you choose from three different loadouts, and you actually, as you level up, because you do level up in this game, uh, you get things like parts for your Morphe. That's what he's called. It's a Morphe. You can make them look different, which is really fun. You can get some really ridiculous-looking combinations. You can kind of move things around or, uh, you know, really make them the way you want them to look. Um, and to get these kind of parts, you break pinatas as you level up or do different missions, uh, you know, like maybe one of them was fly around for 600 meters the other day and I couldn't quite get it, but I would have gotten a pinata. You break the pinata, you get free goodies. Uh, it's usually gear for your character to look differently or musical instruments. Now, going back to the loadouts though with the guns, uh, as you level up, you get access to different types of primary and secondary parts on your gun. 
So it's one gun, but it has different parts to it. So you might have one that's like an automatic shooter, and then you might have on top a thing that launches uh, what everybody's favorite thing is, the Fat Hawk. It's basically this big flying explosion. Um, and then there's also special moves, like you can drop a... Uh, you can drop a... Brain's going dead. Uh, a shield, or you can... There's actually a fart move that knocks them out. Uh, so it's a little tongue-in-cheek. Uh, and eventually you can charge up what are called ultimorphs. Now, ultimorphs are these massive... Uh, think like Splatoon, whenever you build up a character, uh, where you are going to launch like a... Throw rain or something like that. Well, in this game, you can do things like shooting electricity from the sky and stuff like that. So... You know, if you were going to compare this game to another game, it would probably be Splatoon. As far as playability, uh, there's some interesting movement mechanics based on your size. It's not quite as easy to move around as uh, Splatoon is, but there is gyro controls, which I love. Me some gyro controls. Not on the PC, but on the Switch there are. I'm looking forward to it hitting the Switch again instead of PC so I can actually get back to those because I am much better with uh, movement and aiming with gyro compared to, uh, you know, the elite gamers who play with keyboard and mouse. I'm an unfortunate, lowly console peasant. So, um, anyway, so there are some different modes that you play in this. There's Morph Match. It's like the simplest game mode there is. You essentially shoot the enemy and it makes the avatar grow. Uh, mass Heist is where you steal mass. So you make your character big by shooting people. You run over to this altar, and you have, and it sends your mass to a um, to the avatar on your team. So it's a little bit tougher because it's not automatically transferred, and you kind of have to go find the altar that's active. And it's you know you can kind of guess where people are going and stuff. Uh, another one is headhunt. So it starts off where the avatars don't have their head, and you essentially have to go pick up the head and put it somewhere. And it will get bigger. Uh, and it will charge. So, uh, it's pretty interesting as far as a mode goes. Uh, and you have, you have some different mechanics because you have to like protect the head as it's charging. So that's really fun. Uh, and the last one is... Uh, let's see. Oh, that was Headhunt. I'm sorry. The last one is The Master. The Master is my favorite way to play. It is a new mode. Uh, and it's essentially where a golden sombrero from the gods, or the Morphes, whatever, appears above the head of the person who has the most mass. And it actually allows you to track down, you know, the bad guys. It allows you to see who's, uh, if it's, if the master's on your team, you can run and go protect them, and it switches out based on who's the biggest. So, if you want to know more about the game, uh, I've been doing a couple of streams on Twitch, and uh, you can find them on YouTube, usually from our page, twitch.tv slash lamergamerspodcast. Uh, I'll put everything on our YouTube page. I wish I could tell you an easy way to look up the YouTube page, but it's a whole bunch of weird ri random letters and numbers. So just type in Lamer Gamers Podcast and you'll find us on there. Look for the happy blue and orange logo. Uh, anyway, so next up, we are going to be talking about the Xbox One X Bonanza. So, I'm a Nintendo gamer. I play PC games, and I play Nintendo games, and that's, that's about it. It has kept me pretty happy for the last billion years that I've been playing video games. Or, well, since, you know, anything, I guess since I've been an, an adult really. Because uh, before then, I only owned Nintendo systems. Nintendo versus Sega. I think my parents had a Sega, and I played some games. I didn't really enjoy it. I've always been a big Nintendo fan. And since I've been out of college, you know, I got back into gaming, uh, and I really was okay with having a PC that could play video games. Because I generally try to keep a PC that is strong enough to do uh, artwork on because I do things in Illustrator, I do freelance graphic design whenever I want to. Uh, I don't actively look for it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I create art, I teach how to make art and stuff. So I need to have a computer that can do some stuff. Well, generally that means, well, cool, I can play games too and make money off of 
making graphics and stuff. So it's been pretty easy for me to be a PC gamer. Well, with the Xbox, yes, Bell, that is correct. By the way, this is the Lamer Gamers Podcast, where you will hear random dog noises in the background at any time. And I have the whiniest of all pit bulls, Bell, who is trying to get attention from me and everything else. Uh, anyway, back to what I was talking about. Um, so, uh, it's been easy for me to stay up with PC, and most of the time Xbox games and PC games are pretty close to the same. I mean, there's not a lot of things that I can't get on the PC that are on the Xbox that I really wanted to play. Now, Sony, that's a little bit different. And so, on the last couple of podcasts, I've been talking about, you know, do I want to get a Sony PS4 Pro? We actually did that as a topic. And then out of nowhere, after this E3... Game Pass for PC hit. And it was like a Trojan horse to get Microsoft all up in my house. So the cool thing with Game Pass is that it allows you to connect to the Xbox ecosystem. Uh, And this was a good way to pull me into their ecosystem out of the middle of nowhere. And they ran a deal where you could get Xbox Game Pass, PC Game Pass, and Xbox Live Gold for 15 bucks a month. And to try it out, you could do it for $1 a month. So, that's how they got me. And here's where I'm at and the place I'm in to think about why I wanted to get this. I... I'm at the point where there's about to be a new uh, generation of games, which you know, I'm probably sure that you're thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. Why did you get something at the end of this generation? I'll explain that later on. But it was just too good of a deal. I managed to find it on Newegg for $369. No taxes are paid in Texas. Yeehaw. Uh, from new eggs so I jumped on this because it's normally a $500 system now it was bundled in with uh, possibly one of the my least favorite games right now Fallout 76 but you know I can let that slide because it was actually cheaper than buying or I think it was like a four dollar difference from buying the Xbox One X all by itself now I was looking at the specs of the Xbox One X and they're pretty surprising, actually. They're closest to an RX 580. Now, I'm currently running an RX 480 on my PC. So you probably think there's not much of a difference. But there actually is. The 580 is capable of running uh, 4K gaming. And my computer setup is kind of capable of it. Uh, you know, I've ran a couple games on my TV in 4K from my computer. But... It would have a hard time and usually it would crash. Also, the issue with Windows and TVs and surround sound systems is they're not very good at pushing surround sound, mainly because you know sometimes the PC developers don't want to pay for that Dolby license. And I have an older surround sound system. Um, and you know, it's kind of where I got to the point to where, well, you know, I want to get into 4K gaming. I want my surround sound, you know, I want to be able to enjoy the visual clarity of a 4K game in HDR, and oh my gosh, HDR looks amazing, get more into that in a minute, and I want to be able to play my surround sound as loud as possible to shake my house. Now, I live out in the middle of nowhere, uh, where all you can hear are trains and dogs, uh out here so it doesn't matter how loud I play it I know it's a special circumstance because a lot of people are living in apartments but that ain't me I can play things loud now with that being said uh, I was looking at the price difference and I started looking up you know what is a an equivalent to an Xbox one X probably need to be a little bit stronger because the way they code for consoles actually allows them to pull some more power out of their graphics cards Uh, Because they have low-level access, like they can code specifically to the rule set, I guess you would, if you want to make an analogy, the rule set of the card, opposed to programming to a generic settings of a billion cards. Uh, So, looking on what they have, the closest thing to an Xbox One X they could find 
was about a $900 system. Now, that's because it included Windows 10 and all this other stuff, but to still have the PC, you had to go that extra mile to be able to use it. And it was pretty fun to research it. Uh, I found all sorts of ridiculous comments. If you were following the Twitter while I was in research mode, you got to see the comments that I would share that I found online because there are some ticked off PC elitists that don't like the fact of the Xbox One X being as strong as it is for the price. Uh, I saw one glorious comment about all the Xbox owners being console peasants. That's the funniest thing in the world to me. <laughs> so, Because I'm a dirty console peasant. I can't live up to the glory of the masters of PC. Now, I have been a PC gamer forever, but I'm not going to drop $4,000 on a rig to play games for a couple years that are not optimized for it. I've, you know, I'm a big fan of RPGs, and I've ran into just too many issues where RPGs just aren't made really well for PC. Um, now, I'm talking about first-person RPGs. Now, there's more C RPGs, which are computer-based RPGs. Uh, usually, those top-down ones run a lot better on computers. But whenever they started getting to this whole movement with the Fallout series and all these others where they're doing first-person RPGs or action RPGs, they generally ran a lot better on a console with a controller. So that's really where I was at. You know, can I, should I go out and spend $900 on a new computer to run things that probably won't run real well? Or can I spend $369 and get Game Pass, which is going to allow me to have access to hundreds of games and there are plenty that I haven't played. And that's really what it boiled down to was the price was just perfect. The Trojan horse that Microsoft has created to get into my home was this beautifully wrapped up package. And I'm like, oh, look, it's a giant electronic horse. This is a gift. I should bring it into my home. And now it's here. And I got to say, I enjoy the console. Uh, Overall, I've had a lot of fun playing it. Now, when I got the console, though, and it was a discussion with my wife, and my wife, I think, knows at this point, whenever I'm interested in something and I go into research mode, because I get into a really deep, dark research mode whenever I'm interested in something, um, and anybody that knows me can tell you, if I'm interested in something, I'm going to like look into it, and then I'll move on to the next thing. I, I just like research in general and knowing a lot of things. And she, you know, we were kind of talking it out. She was sitting on the couch and she's like, yeah, I think, I think it's a good idea. I convinced her, but I, I don't know if she was listening anymore. Sure. But I think I was just uh, wearing her down because it was just too good of a deal. So I got it. I told Rowdy 5000 about it. He was excited about it. Um, even though it was different because I was going to look for a PS4 Pro, but the graphical clarity on the Xbox One X is four times the amount of PS4. And the way they code to the system directly, they're actually getting more than four times the power out of the system uh, based on some things I've watched on Digital Foundry. So there's some neat little tricks that they're using for this new generation, or well, this in generation console. Um, but I have some other friends that, I've, uh, that have Xboxes, uh, <laughs> Skylar and Ryan. Uh, or I guess I should have used their names on here. They told me, yeah, you can call me by your names because they heard me talking about them on another episode. So, Mom, Mom, and Gunslinger, uh, <laughs> I play Diablo with them. So if you ever seen pictures of Diablo on our Twitter, it's with them. Uh, and I told them about this cataclysmic event, about buying an Xbox that I had wrought upon the world. And basically what Ryan was telling me is what he mentioned, or they, I think I'd sent him a text and he read it to Skylar and it was essentially, what? No way. Really? Did that really happen? Something along those lines. So, uh, it's been really cool. I've actually been playing, um, playing some, uh, Monster Hunter World and I got to introduce Gunslinger, rur, rur, uh, to Monster Hunter franchise in general. And we've been having fun playing that late at night. Got to figure out a way to sneak, uh, mom mom in there but we'll see uh but anyway so the thing is that as far as the console i guess i'll do a little review of it it's a nicely built console it doesn't 
you know, rattle or shake when you pick it up. Uh, it's a good looking design. It doesn't, the pictures don't do it justice. Uh, it, I mean, it's nothing too terribly exciting, to be honest. Uh, it looks good on a shelf. It's not going to be a big show out like the uh, Nintendo Wii was or anything. Where you had that, you know, sort of drastic vertical orientation of a console that really hasn't been seen before and a blue light that shines out. Granted, you can use a vertical stand on the Xbox One X. Uh, I've seen some pictures of it, but, I mean, it doesn't really fit my stuff. Anyway, so I went ahead and picked up a 2 terabyte hard drive with it. And just kind of, in general, the UI is clunky as can be. I absolutely hate the user interface in the Xbox. I've gotten a little more used to it, and some of the things are kind of smart with the way that you connect through chat and stuff like that. And I'm able to stream from it, which you can't do with the Switch, but it's just clunky. To get to your games is a big mess, so ended up making all these groups. I've probably done three or four different like revisions on my groups, as I like to be able to just hop in and play. Um, I was told by, uh, you know, my mom and gunslinger river, uh, that I don't need to leave mine in the, uh, always on mode or the instant on mode. So I've been hopping back and forth. I try to turn it completely off at night, but I haven't seen any issues when leaving it on instant on. I, I know the Xbox one X has a little bit more power, so we'll see if it, you know, how long it stays before it really starts slowing down. Now, whenever I got the system, I thought the clunkiness might be to the fact that I downloaded, um, 30 games? Something like that from Game Pass, which are part of the Game Pass program. Uh, could be that, but it wasn't. After everything's downloaded, it took about a whole day to do. Um, uh, it's still kind of clunky. It's still kind of a mess. I really hope whenever Scarlet comes out that... They move some of that UI over to it. We'll see what happens. Now, as far as the controller goes, the controllers are excellent. Uh, comparing it to a Pro Controller, which is my other baby, uh, it feels probably a little bit nicer. The buttons are that really hard plastic. Don't really care for the uh, buttons too much that are on the face buttons. The triggers are really well, and the joysticks are a joy. Pun. Anyway. Uh, graphically, the games are astounding. So I spent a lot of time doing research, as I do, trying to figure out the exact settings for my TV to be able to run HDR. I looked at pre-calibration and post-calibration settings and all this other stuff. Uh, which, by the way, if you ever get a chance, type in your TV, uh, TV number, whatever it is. Like, mine's a Samsung MU6500, something like that. Uh, and I think it's ratings.com, R-T-I-N-G-S. They give you post-calibration settings to get kind of the best uh, connection to the colors that you need to have in the gamut. Gamut is essentially, it's not a dog. It's a range of colors, if you've ever seen that, and what colors are displayable on your screen. So I looked it up, and... I found out how to do my HDR settings and all that kind of stuff. Looked up different games and how to set them right. So there was a lot of research as far as like a sort of plug and play system the Nintendo Switch is. This is not it. The Xbox takes a bit of research and work to really get the most out of it. But once you do, it's once it's tuned in there and right, man, it is astounding. So I've gotten all this stuff set up. And I'm really pretty happy with it. And so I've played a lot of games. Now, I haven't necessarily beat a lot of games, but I've been playing too much. It's almost, it's almost like a job. So the first one that I really kind of wanted to go into was Forza. I'm not a big racing game fan. I just think it's pretty. And... My wife has family from England, so basically the only reason I got that is because A, it's free, and B, it's got a lot of recreations of different places in England. So I pulled that game up, I played a little bit of it, it's fun, I'm not really in it for the races at the moment. I'm essentially just playing it in, oh pretty mode, it's so pretty. 
Um, the graphics are really well done on it. It has nice HDR settings. You actually see some nice pop. The sunsets pop. Uh, it's really great stuff. Another one that I played that... Uh, some indie games that I tried out. Everspace, which is kind of Star Fox-esque. Um, it kind of loads you up in this spaceship. There's no ground you can get on or anything. And I'm assuming all the little sections are uh, randomly generated. It's a roguelike. And you're trying to get from one end of a star, t or a star system to another. And it, I don't know if there's a purpose or an end to it. It's another really nice looking game. It's definitely graphics over gameplay to me. It, I don't feel like it was explained really well in the system, in the game itself. Um, however, for an indie developer, I mean, it is spectacular for an indie developer. But it really wasn't what I was looking for. It was another one of those games where I was like, oh, it's pretty. And tried it. It's, it's good looking. So if you just want to fly around in space with meaningless purpose and just kind of hover around out there, you'll like it. You just want to shoot bad guys and stuff, but if you're looking for a real drawn-out story, it's not really there. Uh, another one was Outer Wilds. Now, everybody is freaking out about Outer Wilds, and I can see why. Outer Wilds is a game that is another really pretty game, really nice art style to it, but it's a definite Groundhog's Day game where you are constantly repeating things over and over. Uh, as you get further into it, you kind of get a time limit, uh, but I rarely got to the time limit before I got killed. Um, and you're this alien dude who is going to go out to the stars to find uh, artifacts or just find out about other people, or you can find this person that's missing. And you're in this solar system that is constantly moving, like there's actual... Um, gravity to the stars and uh, to the planets and things like that and they're always synchronous uh, geosynchronous or I guess solar synchronous I don't know if geosynchronicity matches really with what I'm saying but it's basically constantly moving around a uh, solar system um, and it's it's kind of fun but I don't like the fact that I have to start completely over and go back to the beginning. And that's kind of one of those things where it's like I'm automatically done because I don't want a game to waste my time. And that's what I feel like. I'd be wasting 10 minutes each time just restarting it. So it's fun. I don't know if I'd continue playing it. Uh, but if you are looking for a really good indie and you're kind of into those Groundhogs roguelike game, man, Outer Wilds is the way to go. Um, just beautiful graphics, brilliant soundscaping. Uh, in other words, what you hear is just extremely high quality. And you have this cool little um, ray, not really a ray gun, but it's this thing that can take in um, sounds from different planets or satellites passing by, and you can aim them at them, and it will play it on the uh, in your headset. So, like, I was able to point my little soundy dingy and went to that planet and found a guy playing a guitar. That was pretty cool. Um, now, you can die by walking around and getting killed by ghosts. So it's got this weird, like, paranormal stuff going on with it. Uh, I got completely destroyed by walking into a cave. And it's, it's an exploration game. I wanted to explore. Um, the gravity in the game makes it a little hard to fly at times, but I think overall, if you're just into any sort of space games, it's the way to go. Uh, another game that I really got, because it, it's weird, and my wife will probably like it, even though it's extremely weird, is Graveyard Keeper. Um, if you've ever played Harvest Moon, and decided that you wanted to leave the Harvest Moon life of hanging around with happy little cows and chickens and getting married to people, and you just wanted to go bury bodies, then that's Graveyard Keeper. It's a weird game. So essentially in the game, you die, and you come back to life. I don't know if it's some sort of like in-between world, um, and you're talking to the skull that's somehow talking to you, and you're a Graveyard Keeper, and you've kind of got to almost blend in, and it turns into where you're doing... You're trying to make the graveyard look nicer and keep it up. 
there's a communist donkey that will deliver um, it'll deliver bodies to you you autopsy them you sell the meat underhanded in the black market like i said it's a little messed up and it's humor is extremely dark so don't go into this thinking it's gonna be harvest moon it's not gonna be animal crossing there's not happiness here it is kind of dark and messed up and there seems to be some sort of um hunt for witches going on so it's got really dark humor it's interesting the art looks interesting uh there's some it's not quite as refined as the Harvest Moon games. You can tell it was definitely a PC game or Stardew Valley. It wants to be Stardew Valley in a parallel universe. And it tries to... We'll see. Um, the other games that I was going to try was the Metro series. So I started with Metro Exodus because it's one of those, like I said, I'm in... Ooh, pretty mode with my Xbox One X. And I wanted to see Metro Exodus and see how nice it looks. And oh man, it, it looks good. Granted, you're always in the dark and you're always getting like monsters trying to eat your throat. It's kind of scary. And I was really interested in it. In it. it played really well. It was a beautifully done game graphically. And then I talked to Rowdy. He's like, dude playing metro exodus and he's like dude i can't get into games without knowing all the other stuff from all the other ones so i decided okay well i'm gonna try to do the same thing to where i am trying to start from the beginning so i did i downloaded metro redux 2033 and metro last light which is you know, they're all games based off of the Metro book series, uh, which is a Russian series about, it's post-apocalyptic, you know, the bombs went off or something, and you're living underground. You're in the Metro, okay? So, which for those that live out in the country like me that don't know what a Metro is, that is train stations underground. I think I got that right. We'll see if somebody from New York tells me. I'll have to ask uh, somebody on the GW Discord. <laughs> anyway, so you're basically underground, and it's this whole book series about it. So I was thinking, oh, cool. Well, I can play Metro Redux 2033, read the book, talk about it. But my goodness, Metro 2033 is, like, tough as nails. Like I said, I've been a Nintendo Sector gamer that has not played a lot of FPSs in my life. I don't have my gyro controls. I'm not very good at FPSs. Now, I did start looking into it. It's supposed to be a tough as nails game. But I think I put it on uh, what is called Spartan mode. And it makes all the enemies bullet sponges. So, I've noticed that there are some weird issues on Metro 2033 Redux where I can shoot a monster in the head. And he'll kill one monster, but then the one next to it I shoot in the head, it doesn't seem to do the same thing. So there's some weird, like, sporadicity with how um, how much damage does to the monsters. So I might jump back into it. I'm having a hard time trying to finish it um, right now, following some dude named Bourbon. And Bourbon is leading me to all these places. So it's very Russian. Now, with that being said, the... Uh, I guess culture around it and the people in the small places where there are people existing are really well done. It's almost like the world exists without you there and honestly could care less if you're there. You're not going into this game as the savior like you are in most other games. You're kind of on your own separate thing. Now in Exodus, which is more open, and I started playing that again because it is a little bit more... I guess my level. Uh, you're kind. You're not really a savior. Everybody doubts you. You're wanting to leave the metro and find other people. So, because they don't think there is any other civilizations, and they're the only ones left because there are monsters roaming everywhere. And there's uh, Homo Novus, which is the new uh, evolution of humans, and they're basically taking over. So, 
It's a weird game. It's got some cool paranormal stuff in it, too. It's a very cool story. It'll be interesting to see where it goes. And I'm going to try... <laughs> I'm going to try to go back and finish Metro 2033. I just don't know if I can do it, guys. So I'm going to play games that I have fun with, like Sea of Thieves. Now... Earlier, I know Rowdy was sick, but we did some Sea of Thieves on the stream. And man, it is a good game. Now, Sea of Thieves is definitely my probably top pick graphically from a point of the actual graphics in the game and the techniques that are using and the overall aesthetics for any Xbox One X game I've played. The attention to detail in the HDR usage is fantastic. The One of the things I tweeted the other day was that the sunrises are quite possibly uh, the most beautiful renditions of a sunrise uh, of any game. And I will have to say it, as an insomniac, I've seen some sunrises. But man, they are pretty and very realistically colored in Sea of Thieves. If you ever go out and... I don't know how many of y'all live out by the beach or by uh, lakes. I'm in an area that is full of water. And there's something special about going out at 4 a.m. with a cup of coffee, whether that's on the beach or you're able to just go somewhere and watch the sun come up. There's that sort of haziness and the yellow that comes in before it start, the sun starts coming over the horizon. And... All the colors on everything changes, the translucency in the water, the reflection. It's just beautiful, and they captured it in Sea of Thieves. Now, in general, the color usage is just spectacular in general. The game is not overly realistic outside of the water and the lighting, though. It is a very cartoony game, but they did it very nicely, and everything just kind of fits. The monsters that are in it are really fun. We were attacked by a Kraken the other day. That was scary as all get out. You can shoot each other out of cannons. Now, it is a co-op game. So, you can kind of play by yourself. And I've done it a few times because <laughs> I'm literally just going out in the boat to see how pretty it is by myself. And just going to random islands and... Uh, getting into trouble or, you know, looking for treasure. But it's much better when you have two people because you have to raise, you have to drop the sails, you have to angle them, you have to drive the boat, there might be people coming in. It helps if you have somebody up in the crow's nest, somebody to hit the anchor whenever it's time, shoot cannons, all this other stuff. So you can change the size of your boats to make them more manageable, depending on your crew. You can have two to four people. It is an excellent, excellent game, though. It's just pure fun. And, you know, it's a Rare... It's game made by Rare. Rare used to be owned by Nintendo. So this is really special for me as an old Nintendo nerd coming back and playing a Rare game because it's got that charm that I kind of missed from Rare games. And, you know, Microsoft acquired them years ago. And Microsoft is uh, all about acquiring people. I mean... Uh, you know, that you've heard the joke, uh, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Well, nobody expects the Microsoft Inquisition. My good acquisition. My goodness. I mean, they just acquire anybody that comes after them or they want. Um, so, you know, they kind of had some rough years. Some people had left the company. But right now, their team they have back is spot on. There's another company that's with Nintendo Retro that Retro and Rare, you know, we're in their heyday back a couple, heck, I don't know, 10 years ago at this point uh, with Nintendo, and they have not come back. I'm hoping they come back in the same way Rare has, because Rare is doing a bang-up job right now. So, the base of the game. You are basically going out. You're, you know, you're finding treasure maps. You go find the treasure. You work for these different companies, and you raise your prestige within the company. It gives you more access to things. I'm not really sure if there's an ending point to this game, uh, which, kind of like Everspace, the only difference is I'm having way more fun. Now, I don't know how good this game is to play if you're by yourself, though, or if you don't like people. To be honest, I don't care for people very much. 
Um, outside of some people, you know, I work with a lot of people. I teach a lot of people. But random people online, that's, uh, you never know what you're going to get. And they're all very young, so, you know, we'll, we'll see if I keep playing it whenever Rowdy stops playing it. Uh, I'm not sure. But we're having a fun time, and we will be streaming that in the future for sure. Uh, now, fun thing on our last one, which you can find on YouTube or on our Twitch page, uh, we found a chicken coop, and we called it Chicken. And we have named him the Colonel. <laughs> and the Colonel is leading us to treasure. So if you're into weird humor, then follow our Twitter. Or follow our, well, follow our Twitter, follow our Twitch, or whatever. Anyway, uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is upcoming games, items of interest, and streams that I'm planning on doing. But first, I have to get to the last game on my list that I'm excited about playing on the Xbox One X, and that is Monster Hunter World. Now, I also work with the Game Witness Discord. I help run uh, the Game Witness Discord. You can find them, of course, on Discord. Um, and we have a huge crew of Monster Hunters. Well, me being a sad person without a PS4, didn't get to join in the hunt. So luckily, I've had Gunslingerer join in the party with me. And Monster Hunter World is a blast. Now, I've played, let's see, Monster Hunter Try, Monster Hunter Ultimate, Monster Hunter 4. So I've played a bit of Monster Hunter in the past, and this one is a really nicely well done version. Now, the graphics are hit or miss. They have some weird... Uh, whatever they're using for the aerial perspective, and if you don't know what aerial perspective is, it's is as things get back into the distance, they look closer to the sky color. So if you ever like drawing or painting and you want to make something look like it's further away, mix in a little bit of the sky color and that'll help it help it look like it's further away. Anyway, so they're doing some weird thing for that whenever it's like a really bright light. But the colors on the monsters look good. I had to move up the color in the game, though, to deal with that weird uh, usage of HDR in the game. Um, graphically, it's really nicely done. I am running it in 4K. You have different modes you can choose from in the graphics. Um, the monsters are very realistic. The way you fight them is very cool. I'm playing as an Insect Glaive user so there's all these cool lighting effects and things flying around and i'm jumping on monsters backs i mean it is epically done and monster hunter has always been like this big boss hunt game um and but man it is so much better is so much bigger and you are actually on a hunt you track down tracks uh you find different monsters sometimes the monsters fight each other it is a blast so I would highly suggest if you've never played I think they have an upcoming um, DLC. Uh, I haven't really looked into it that much, but it looks like it's a whole bunch of ice worlds and ice monsters. So I'm looking forward to that and seeing how far I can go because now I have I managed to get somebody into the game with me. Because <laughs> honestly, hardly anybody I know owns an Xbox and plays Monster Hunter World combined. So, we'll see how that goes. All right, up next is going to be upcoming games, items of interest. All right, so, as we continue down this path on the Xbox episode, which has gone much further than I thought it would. 43 minutes is uh, way more than I thought it would bloviate. So, I'm going to talk about some games that I'm interested in. Um, first up, uh, on Game Pass, they just dropped it July 4th, Middle Earth Shadow of War. So I'm looking forward to that one. I have not played it yet. I did play the Shadow of Mordor, which their names are just way too similar for me because I, I was having to like, okay, which one is which? Which one am I really going to talk about? I played a little bit of Shadow of Mordor on the Game Pass, which was already there. And it was fun, but honestly, the story, I mean, it's, it's not not going to live up to Lord of the Rings. So I'm just going to go ahead and skip the first one and move on to Shadow of War. And that's what the consensus generally is. Now, Middle-earth Shadow of War plays a lot like a 
somebody said it's a mixture of like Assassin's Creed and Batman type games. Um, and to me, it, it reminds me a lot of Assassin's Creed. And you're mostly just hunting different people. Now, you can interrogate bad guys and find out giant bosses to go hunt down and stuff like that. It's just a fun kind of fantasy Assassin's Creed. Uh, definitely am looking forward to that. Another one is on September 12th, they have Borderlands 3. And I've got to go back and play Borderlands 2 again because it's been a long time and I don't remember anything about the game uh, before that comes out. So September 13th is pretty far away. The Borderlands stuff is on Game Pass and they're constantly selling it for dirt cheap. I'm actually going to give away the Borderlands Handsome Collection probably here in a couple weeks. I've been waiting till it is no longer like three bucks everywhere. So uh, Another game is Jedi Fallen Order. I'm not as interested in it as Rowdy is. That's dropping on November 15th. But they said it's going to play like Metroid. We'll see. The Outer Worlds, I've talked about a lot already. It is the, um, it's kind of like a sci-fi, uh, spacey, or not Kevin Spacey, but, but like a space-based, uh, Fallout game is what they're kind of selling it as. And it has a lot of the members from the team that did Fallout New Vegas. The Outer Worlds is part of it, a group that was acquired by Microsoft, uh, which is Paradox Studio or Paradox Interactive, and I love these people. Uh, the Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire is by far one of my favorite PC games, and the writing on it is spectacular. So I'm hoping they kind of get that same charm there. Another one that looks cool is Doom Eternal. It's on November 22nd, and it just looks cool. It looks like more Doom. It looks scary-ish. But, I mean, it's just mindless or monster killing. So, looking forward to that one. Uh, Watch Dogs Legion, March 6th, will be one that I'm looking to get on Xbox One X. And it's, we've talked about it before, I want to be the old grandma assassin named Helen. That's really all I want to do. I haven't played any Watch Dogs games, so I will be playing Watch Dogs 2 before Watch, Dog Le Ugh. Watch Dogs Legion. Um, so, I'm going to find more about it, but this is, of course, the game that's running on a similar engines to the Assassin's Creed games. Uh, but much more hacking. So we'll see how that goes. Cyberpunk 2077, April 15th. Of course I'm going to get it. I, I don't have much to say. I just really want to play Cyberpunk because I'm interested in the universe. I'm currently reading a book called Hardwired right now, which from what I understand is kind of what the Cyberpunk universes are spawned off of, uh, or at least they inspired the cyberpunk universes so i'm working on my way reading through that one and it's a really cool book series following a uh, person that's essentially a transporter that and a woman that's an assassin so it's and you know all these corporations are fighting for control of the world it's just a really good story unexpected game i'm interested in is minecraft dungeons because it's essentially diablo i am not a fan of minecraft not at all. So I was really surprised with Dungeons, but it sounds cool. You can craft new weapons and things like that. It's a Diablo-esque game. Wasteland 3 is the last thing that I'm really, really interested in. Mainly because I like the Wasteland universe. I'm excited to play it. So those are the games that I'm looking forward to the most coming up on Microsoft. And next thing we're going to go over is the xCloud and end it with our rumor section called Fake News. All right, xCloud. So we are going to talk a little bit about what xCloud is. Now, the other day, so this would have been July 4th, man, they released, like, they announced games on July 4th, and they started sending people uh, invites to xCloud on July 4th. I don't know what is up with Microsoft on that day, but that was really unexpected. So, right off the bat, if you don't know what xCloud is, it is going to be the Google Stadia competitor. It is a cloud-based gaming platform where you can essentially play a game on your computer or a little streaming box without having to own a super-powered computer. So, they are 
and it gives you the access to play really high res like 4K games over the interwebs. I'm skeptical, mainly because I know that one, there's definitely infrastructure issues going from the provider, which would be Microsoft and their Azure servers. They're not, they're called Azure down to the local companies, down to your houses, or to your even streets, lines, down to your personal lines. There's just so much room for issues. Now, with that being said, on test, the lag has actually been almost three times quicker than Google Stadia. They've had about 63 milliseconds of lag uh, versus Stadia's 166 milliseconds of lag. So it's looking pretty good. Now, some of the rumors that are coming around it, so I guess some of the fake news, and we'll just go ahead and jump into the fake news of the day, is that they actually use multiple Xboxes to stream. Like, So years ago when the PS3 came out, you could actually combine them together to make a supercomputer. Well, it appears that they're doing something of a similar nature with the Xbox One X or the Xbox S's. Somebody had said that there are four to five S's that are working in tandem to stream. That's kind of a little crazy. And they're already starting to sell phone clips for your phone to clip onto Xbox controllers. So get ready, it is coming. Um, and that's gonna be an interesting thing. And now they have invited the people to play xCloud that are like the top gamers on various lists in the Microsoft Insider program. So it's going to be interesting to see how this comes about. Now, the thing is, I'm starting to have some questions about this. So some of the rumors that are popping up, or some of the fake news popping up, is that there is still a mini Xbox that they are wanting to push for about $60. Now, I don't know how realistic that's going to be because that would have to be without the controller. But it's essentially like a, think about like how Google Chromecast Ultra works, which is what they're going to put Stadia on. And you would take this little streaming box and be able to play Xbox games. You mix that with the Xbox Game Pass, and that's a wonderful little Trojan horse to get into more people's houses or on their cell phones or on their tablets. So, it's going to be interesting, and you wouldn't even need the little streaming box to get on tablets or anything, I don't believe. So, we'll see how that goes, or if that's going to even come to fruition. But you got to think, if they're going that way with this, who else are they competing against? Because it's not just Google Stadia. They're also going to be competing against the Switch, because they are still jumping into the mobile platform. This may be a way that they could actually get in your pocket with their Trojan horse of sorts, um, instead of you having to go out and buy another system. Because if you have the, and this is how they're doing the test right now, um, they're testing it on phones. So if you have your phone with you, if you have a decent connection, you hook up to some Wi-Fi, or you have good 4G or 5G connection, you're good to go with this. And if it's really as low uh, lag as it is, We'll see if it works out. Like I said, I'm extremely skeptical with it. Uh, another one is that, another rumor that's coming out is that the new Xbox is not necessarily a new generation. That the Xbox One, the idea of the Xbox One is that it is a way to permanently name the Xbox system. So basically, if they release a game on Xbox Scarlet, they would you would also be able to play that game on your Xbox One systems. So, or you could play it on your mini Xbox system for the X Cloud. So it's going to be what the rumors are that are kind of spinning around is that the Xbox is not necessarily going to kill the ones they'll still be around they'll still be able to play games but they will scale and that makes a lot of sense you look at what nintendo has forced everybody to do with scalability in the mobile industry where you see games that are running on the uh switch that are also running on the xbox one and the ps4 and they work you know we're when we have this big jump up to scarlet 
I still expect, and this is another reason why I'd mentioned it earlier that I was going to tell you this. I think the Xbox One X will be able to play Scarlet games, but it'll be low in compared to the Scarlet. At least for a generation or two of, you know, the first year or two of games. So to me, the Xbox One X was a good deal if what I'm thinking is going to be correct. So we'll see how it plays out. We still have a long ways to go. This next console war is going to be exciting and it's going to be intense. All right, so I think that is enough for me. I have talked way longer than I thought I would by myself. So thank you guys for checking in. Uh, thanks for listening to our podcast. You know, in the last, that took us three months to hit 100 listeners. And within a couple weeks, we'd hit 200. And we're about to hit 300 within a less than a week. So I really appreciate y'all checking in. I appreciate... Uh, family and friends that have checked it and shared it. I appreciate the people that are retweeting and liking because you guys are doing awesome and let us know what you like, what you don't like, so we can continue improving on this side quest from professional life that Rowdy and I are doing. Alright, so that is it for me. Uh, check us out on Twitter at LamerGamersCast at twitch.tv slash LamerGamersPodcast uh, and pretty much anywhere now you can get podcasts and if you can't find us, let me know. That is it for me. I am out.